Section 6 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Tobogganing. If skating be the poetry of motion, and who shall say no, tobogganing is certainly the perfection of motion. There is nothing of a kind to surpass it in the world, for coasting, however good, is not to be mentioned in the same breath with this glorious sport. No previous acquaintance with fast going, speeding along behind the fast trotter, or over the shining rails at the tail of a lightning locomotive would prepare you for the first shoot down a regular toboggan slide. The effect upon a beginner is brightly illustrated by the replies of a fair American who made her first venture at the Montreal Carnival. Arriving safely at the bottom after a particularly swift descent, she was asked how she liked it. Perfectly splendid, she gasped, as soon as she recovered her breath. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Then, of course, you'll take another. Oh, no, indeed, not for the entire universe. But she did, all the same, and soon became as enthusiastic all the fun as any of her Canadian cousins. All ages and all sorts and conditions of people toboggan in Canada. Indeed, if you were to ask what is the national winter sport of the new dominion, the answer would infallibly be tobogganing. In no other country was it ever known until within the past few years when such accounts of its delight have gone forth that it bids fair to come into common use wherever there is snow enough to permit it. While it can be enjoyed to perfection only at the slides specially prepared for the purpose, any smooth sharp slope with a bit of level plain at its foot, well covered with snow, having a good hard crust, affords the means for fine sport. The advantage of the artificial slide is that it can be kept constantly in order and therefore may be in first class condition for sliding when the snow is altogether too soft and deep upon the hills. These slides are to be seen in every part of Canada. The gaunt framework rising up tall and stiff out of some level field or better still upon a hilltop thus securing a double elevation they are roughly yet strongly constructed of beams and boards and comprise one or sometimes two long throws placed side by side with a flight of stairs adjoining these troughs are curved in the shape of a cycloid and are from three to five feet wide and length of course varying with the height of the structure when winter has finally set in they are paved with big blocks of ice from bottom to top over which loose snow is scattered and then abundance of water poured on until jack frost kindly assisting the whole is welded together into one solid substantial mass. A slide, once properly prepared and kept in order by the addition of a little more snow and water now and then, will last all winter. And the more it is used, the faster and truer it becomes. In the grounds of Rideau Hall, the official residence of the Governor General of Canada, there are two immense slides, and tobogganing may there be enjoyed in full perfection. Let us suppose 
we have been invited to one of those brilliant torchlight fetes which form so popular an item in the program of the viceroy's winter hospitality a more beautiful scene than that which lies all around and underneath us when we have accomplished the toilsome ascent of the steep slippery stairs of the toboggan's light can hardly be imagined stretching away from the narrow platform upon which we stand two long double lines of flaring torches mark out the slides slanting sharply downward until they reach the level far below and then run off to hide their ending somewhere in the dusky recesses of the forest at our left another line of torches interspersed with chinese lanterns encircles a gleaming mirror upon whose surface the skaters glide smoothly this way and that while from its center looking oddly out of season it must be confessed a maple flaunts its rainbow ribbons a little further on the long low circling rink gaily decorated proclaims good cheer from every light window turning to our left we catch through the trees a glimpse of the ever skating pond with its ice palace for the band and quaint lock hot for tired skaters right in front of us a huge bonfire blazes up making music with its merry crackling but we have lingered too long in taking all this in we're stopping the way and an impatient crowd is pressing hard upon us let us place our toboggan then carefully in the center of the groove adjust the cushions coil up the cord and seat ourselves securely with stout grasp upon the handrail all ready cries the steer ay ay we reply giving the pogogan a strong shove he springs on behind with foot outstretched for rudder and the next instant well the only way to describe what follows is that we just drop into space we don't simply coast for so steep so smooth is the descent that we are not conscious of having any connection whatever with the solid earth for at least twenty-five yards and then with a bump and rattle and scrape of hard wood against still harder ice we speed like an arrow through lines of flashing light and rows of open-eyed onlookers until full four hundred yards away we come gently to a stop in the soft deep snow amid the trees the ordinary toboggan is made in the following fashion three strips of birch or basswood a quarter of an inch thick and from four to eight feet long by eight or nine inches broad are put side by side and held in position by cross pieces placed about two feet apart the whole being bound tightly together by lashings of gut for which grooves are cut in the bottom so that they may not be chafed by the snow the thin end of the strips is then turned up and over like the dashboard of a sleigh and secured by strong pieces of gut tied under the first cross piece a long thin pole on either side made fast by loops to the cross pieces for a handrail a comfortable cushion stuffed with straw shavings or wool and a long cord are then added and behold your toboggan is complete as may be guessed from the use of gut for fastenings the toboggan is an indian invention and was in use among the red men as a means of winter conveyance for centuries before the white man saw in it a source of delightful amusement it is doubtful if the indian way of making toboggans can be much improved upon although within the past few years pale-face ingenuity has been exerted toward the end the peculiarity 
of the new toboggans consists in narrow hardwood slats being used instead of the broad thin boards and screws in place of gut lashings. For my own part, I prefer the old fashioned kind. The new fangled affairs are no faster, are a good bit heavier, more liable to break, and being much stiffer, have not that springy motion which forms so attractive a feature of the others. A third kind, just now making its appearance, has the handray held some inches high by means of metal sockets, and the front is gathered into a peak while it too is put together with screws. The higher handrail is unquestionably an advantage, and if it proved durable, will probably render this last style very popular. In choosing a toboggan, you must be careful to select one whose width is straight gained and as free from knots as possible, precisely as a cricketer would choose his bat. The cross pieces should be closely examined, for they have to endure severe strains and will be sure to snap if there is a weak spot in them. Then the good lashings ought to have close inspection, is special care being taken to see that they are well sunk into the wood along the bottom so as to be safe from chafing. Where the gut has given way, I have substituted strong brass wire with very good results. After once it was drawn tight enough, but this I found no easy matter. Having selected a toboggan to your satisfaction, the next thing is to cushion it. The cushion should run the whole length and be not less than two inches thick. Good stout furniture wrap stuffed with excelsior makes a capital cushion, although some prefer heavy rug material and extravagant folk even go the length of fur trappings. The cushion must be well secured to the handrail or it will give trouble by slipping off at the first bump. As to the management of a toboggan, it is not easy to say much more than that it requires a quick eye, a good nerve and strength enough to steer. There are several ways of steering. One is to sit with feet turned up in front and guide the machine by means of sticks held in the hands. Another is to kneel and employ the hands in the same way. Then some very daring and reckless fellows will venture to stand up and using the cord as reins go careering down the slope with the danger of a tremendous tumble every moment. The most sensible and effective way of all, however, is to sit sideways having one leg curled up underneath you and the other stretched out behind like the steering oar of a hailboat, Yankee fashion as it is called in Canada. This mode not only gives you perfect control of your toboggan, but has the further and very important advantage of making it easy for you to roll off and acting as a drag, to bring the whole affair to a speedy stop in the event of danger appearing ahead. More than once have I escaped what might possibly have been serious injury at the cost of a little rough scraping over the snow. From two to six people can sit comfortably on a toboggan according to its length. The perfect number is four, a man at the front to bear the brunt of danger and ward off the blinding spray of snow, two ladies next and then the steerer bringing up the rear and responsible for the safety of all. Ah me! But what a grand thing it is to be young enough to thoroughly enjoy the Pagonian season. The toboggan has many advantages over the sled, such as is used for coasting. Wherever a sled can go, a toboggan can go also, while on many a hill that offers splendid tobogganing, a sled would be quite useless. 
again it is much lighter than the sled which means that you do not have to work half so hard for your fun a third advantage is its safety more especially in the hands of children it has no sharp iron shot ends to make ugly gashes in little legs tobogganing has its perils of course and it and i might if i chose tell some experiences that would perhaps cause a nervous thrill but what sport is absolutely free from danger and since mark twain has earned the gratitude of us all by proving that more people die in their beds than anywhere else why should the most timid be deterred by the faint possibility of peril from enjoying one of the finest and most healthful winter amusements in the world end of section six section seven of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Pelster. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Section 7. A Micmac Cinderella. The dear old stories that delighted us in our nurseries, as mother or sister, lured the lingering dustman to our eyes by telling them over and over, do not by any means belong to us alone. They are the common property of mankind. Even the most rude and ignorant peoples have them in some form or other, and the study of these myths and folklore associated with them is one of the most interesting branches of modern philology. Jack the Giant Killer, Puss in Boots, Aladdin and His Wonderful Lamp, and all the rest of them have their parallels in the farthest corners of the globe. They are to be found, too, among the dusky race, whose mothers told them to their children long before pale face eyes looked covetously upon american shores and pale face powder sent terror into the hearts of brown-skinned braves take this pretty legend of tiam and uchigiasque as it was told to an unforgetful listener beside a micmac campfire in nova scotia and comparing with our own familiar fable of cinderella see if the two are not alike in so many points as to make it easy to believe they had a common origin in the heart of one of those vast forests that used to cover the acadian land with billowy seas of verdure as boundless seemingly as the ocean itself lay a large long lake at one end of which an indian village of more than usual size had grown up it was a capital place for a settlement because the lake abounded with fish the surrounding forest with game and near at hand were sunny glades and bits of open upon which sufficient corn beans and pumpkins could be raised for the needs of the inhabitants so highly did these village folk value their good fortune that they would allow no other indians to share it and any attempt to settle near that lake meant the massacre or flight of the rash intruders a little way from the village the lake shore rose up into a kind of eminence having a clump of trees upon its crown and in the midst of this clump stood a wigwam that had more interest for the maidens of the place than any other they would often watch the smoke wreaths curling up through the trees and wish that in some mysterious way they could get into the interior of that wigwam without the occupants having any warning and many times they would quite by chance you know wander off in that direction or along the beach below where the owner's canoe would be drawn up when he was at home looking out very eagerly and very hopefully from their brown eyes but always returning from their quest disappointed now what was the reason of their curious conduct well i'll tell you in a few words in this wigwam which was larger and finer than any in the village lived a young chief named tiam the moose who was not only very handsome and very rich but who most aggravatingly attractive quality of all possessed the power of making himself invisible at will so that he could be seen only by those to whom he was pleased to reveal himself 
taking these three things into account and adding a fourth to wit that tiam was generally understood to be meditating matrimony is it any wonder that the dusky lasses with seal-brown eyes and ebon locks took a particularly lively interest in the wigwam on the point as was very natural under the circumstances the possessions merits and designs of tiam formed the most important item of village gossip especially as he had made it known that he would select his wife after so curious not to say ungallant a fashion for instead of his going a wooing among the girls he proposed that the girls should come a wooing to him adorned in their bravest attire and looking their very prettiest the maidens were to present themselves before him and the first one that could see him plainly enough to describe what he had on he would marry the way they went about it was as follows they washed their faces anointed their heads bedecked themselves with their brightest ornaments and then directed their steps to the wigwam of tiam arranging it so as to arrive there a little before the hour of the young chief's return from his daily hunting foray tiam's sister who kept house for him and of whom he was very fond would receive them graciously and together they would go down to the shore to await the hunter's coming presently a fine canoe would be seen gliding swiftly over the lake's calm surface eagerly the maidens peer through the gathering shadows but the canoe seems impelled by magic for no human hand is visible as it nears the shore the sister asks namiak richigunum do you see my brother every eye is strained in the direction of the canoe and some over-eager maiden imagination coming to the aid of desire would perhaps pretend she could see its mysterious occupant kugue wisko buksich of what is his carrying strap made is then asked this was a poser but a lucky guess might possibly hit the mark so the aspirant for the chief's hand would make answer that it was a piece of rawhide or wide or, or something else that had been known to be applied to such a use <laughs> oh no the sister would reply softly but crushing out all hope let us go home you have not seen my brother and so they would go back to the wigwam where a little later they would be tantalized by seeing the sister taking a load of game apparently from the air and a pair of moccasins from feet that obstinately refused to be visible thus they were convinced that there was no deception that tiam was really present although they could not see him one after another the village maidens had tried their luck moose hunting <laughs> as they called it but all had failed alike to catch even a glimpse of the provoking master of the wigwam on the point matters had gone on in this unsatisfactory fashion for some time and the fastidious tiam bid fair to be an old bachelor when he was saved from so sad a fate in the way i shall now proceed to relate near the centre of the village stood a large wigwam in which dwelt a widower who had three daughters the eldest of whom was a tall fine-looking girl the second a medium-sized rather plain girl and the youngest a short slight delicate little creature with a pretty pleading face who was despised by her big sister and verily cruelly treated by her because she seemed so weak and useless in fact poor uchigiasque led a wretched life of it for her sister who was of course mistress of the tent would lay far heavier tasks upon her than she could possibly perform and then if they were not done would beat her most unmercifully and sometimes even burn her with brands from the fire when her father who tell the truth was but an indifferent sort of a parent would find her covered with burns and bruises and ask the meaning of it the elder sister would reply that she had fallen into the fire or tripped over a tree root 
or something of that kind and neither uchigiasque nor the second sister dared contradict her they were both so much afraid of her strong hands so this shameful state of affairs continued until the poor girl's condition was most pitiable for her hair was singed off close to her head her face and body scarred with burns and bruises and her back bent with toil it was not strong enough to bear of course the two elder sisters had been among the candidates for tiam's hand and proud as they were of their good looks and of their finery both had failed utterly to see the mysterious chief their despised little sister knew of their going only too well for her persecutor gave her a wicked beating when she came home disappointed by way of working off her ill humour one day when uchigiasque was sitting alone in the wigwam weeping over her hard fate the thought suddenly flashed into her mind why should she not try her fortune at moose hunting it seemed absurd of course but it could hardly make things any worse and even though tiam would not think her worth marrying he might in some way not very clear to the poor girl's troubled mind shield her from her sister's cruelty ochigiasque had no fine clothes to put on a few beads given her by a compassionate squaw were her only ornaments but this did not deter her gathering a quantity of birch bark she fashioned for herself an odd misshapen gown that was ill-fitting enough to give even an indian modiste a turn an old pair of her father's moccasins were soaked to soften them and drawn over her bruised feet and then with a queer headdress to hide her singed pall and her scanty beads arranged to the best advantage she set off quietly one afternoon toward the camp on the point her big sister seeing the direction she was taking screamed after her to come back but she only hastened her steps forward the people of the village stared rudely at her as she passed and divining her purpose hooted derisively after her but she kept steadily on and paid no heed to them her whole heart was in her enterprise and she felt as though she would die rather than turn back at length she reaches tiam's lodge tiam's sister comes to the door and receives her pleasantly at the proper time she conducts her to the landing-place where they await the hunter's return the sister soothing her visitor's throbbing pulse by gentle inquiries as to her life and kindly sympathy for her woes just at dusk a canoe comes toward them shooting swiftly over the water and the sister says that's my brother's canoe can you see him yes murmurs uchigiasque her heart beating high with hope of what then is his carrying strap made munkwan is the quick reply it is a piece of rainbow very good responds the sister with a brilliant smile you have indeed seen my brother let us go home and prepare for him so they hasten back to the wigwam uchigiasque's heart palpitating betwixt delight at her success and anxiety lest tiam when he found what an insignificant little creature she really was might refuse to keep his promise to marry the girl who should first be able to see him as soon as they reach the tent the sister proceeds to prepare her visitor for the nuptial ceremony and the young girl gives herself unhesitatingly into her hands the uncouth birch bark dress is stripped off and flung into the fire and a handsome robe richly adorned with beads takes its place pure spring water is brought 
and as the kind sister dashes it over the girl's face and rubs the scarred features softly with her hands lo every scar and spot and blemish vanishes and the face comes out fair and beautiful as it never was before realizing the wondrous change the young girl utters an exclamation of delight then checks herself and puts her hand to her head ah she says sadly i have no hair tiam will despise me when he sees i have no hair never fear little one the sister answers reassuringly and passing her hands over the singed and frizzled hair behold another marvel for it springs out in richer profusion than ever before and falls in long thick tresses down the back of uchigiasque now too happy to speak catching it up the sister coils it deftly round the young girl's head and then just as the toilet is complete and radiant with joy hope and beauty uchigiasque stands in the centre of the lodge tiam comes bounding in with his load of game at sight of the charming girl before him he stops short and looks inquiringly at his sister then the situation dawns upon him <laughs> wajukus we are discovered at last he says with a bright smile taking the young girl's hand yes brother your wife has come at last replies the sister and is she not a beauty so tiam and ochigiasque were married and like the heroes and heroines of all true fairy tales lived happily ever after end of section seven section eight of my strange rescue this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org my strange rescue by james macdonald oxley section eight blue nose fisher folk scattered up and down the rocky foam fringed shore of nova scotia sometimes standing out bravely upon a promontory that projects into the very midst of the breakers sometimes nestling away cosily in the curve of a quiet bay the white cottages of the hardy fisher folk give touches of warmth and life to a scene that would otherwise be one of unredeemed desolation they are not very imposing edifices and viewed from the respectful distance which the dangers of that inhospitable coast compel the passing ship to keep they seem still smaller than is really the case but they are all homes and in their two or three cramped rooms boys and girls have been born and bred the young people made love and mated and the old people closed their eyes in the last long sleep as generation has succeeded generation so it is no wonder that the lads who thence go forth into distant parts of the world as many of them do find their hearts turning longingly back to the little cottage by the sea and that they often return to spend their last years in the old place voyaging along the coast some lovely summer afternoon and from your comfortable chair on the steamer's deck watching these pretty cottages with their black roofs and white sides coming into view as point after point is opened out and noting how trim and secure they seem and the glorious prospect they command from the windows which look out from either side the central door like sleepless eyes it is easy to imagine that the fishermen's sons must have a fine free healthy life of it and be far better off than the boys in the dusty noisy overcrowded cities well no doubt they are better off in some respects they have plenty of fresh air and sunshine and room to grow in while nothing could be more wholesome than their food of fish and potatoes but their life is a hard one nevertheless and i doubt if many city-bred lads would be eager to exchange with them could they first have a year's experience of it 
if the mackerel herring cod and haddock upon which the fisher folk depend for their living were more regular in their habits and turned up at the same place at the same time every year so that the men with the nets and hooks could count upon their harvests as the men with the size and hose can upon theirs the fisherman's lot would be a fairly comfortable one but there is nothing in this world more uncertain than fish not the slightest reliance can be placed upon them they are here to-day and off somewhere else to-morrow one season school after school of mackerel will pour into the little bay where norman hayes and john mackesy and george brown have their fishing berths as the area assigned to each man is called and fill the seines of these lucky fellows to repletion again and again as fast as they can spread them then perhaps one two three seasons will pass without enough fish putting in an appearance to make one good haul the mackerel catching is the most interesting as it is the most profitable phase of the fisherman's toil and for both reasons the boys like it the best although from its being at the same time the most uncertain in its results they know very well it cannot be depended upon for a living the season for these beautiful and delicious fish begins about the end of june and so soon as it is time for them to appear the highest points along the coast are taken possession of by men and boys who stay there all day long watching intently the surface of the sea below them for the first sign of the silver scales which when caught can be turned into silver coins it is often long and weary work this watching day succeeds day without bringing anything but through scorching sun or soaking rain fine weather or foggy weather the lookouts patiently persevere at last some bright morning when the sea seems still asleep jack hayes's keen young eyes descry a curious ripple on the water far beneath his eyrie his heart gives a throb and his pulses beat like trip hammers but he is afraid at first to shout for fear it is only a morning zephyr shading his eyes with his hand and fairly quivering with excitement he gazes intently for one moment more and then shouting a school a school at the top of his strong young voice he goes bounding down the hillside like a loosened boulder till he reaches the cluster of cottages far below in an instant all is activity and bustle the men spring into the boats lying ready at the little wharves the boys tumble in pell-mell after them the wives and daughters fling their aprons over their heads to keep off the sun and run out to the end of the wharves or climb up on the flakes so that they may see as much as possible in a minute more the boats are heading for the mackerel as fast as brawny arms can drive them half a mile away the calm blue water is dark and disturbed for a space about the size of an ordinary tennis court it looks in fact as if it were boiling and bubbling just there though all around is still and smooth toward this spot the boats are hurried presently they reach it then they stop one of the smaller boats goes up to the long flat-bottomed high-stemmed craft that carries the seine and takes one end of the net on board everything is done quietly for the fish are easily frightened and if alarmed will sink right down into the deep water where they cannot be got at as quickly as sinewy arms can send her along the small boat describes a circle round the fish that continue to frisk about all unconscious of their peril at length a shout of joy announces that connection has been made the two ends of the sen are joined and if it be a person the bottom is drawn together also and then the tired excited fishermen can take a little rest and they try to guess how many barrels this stop of mackerel will make jack hayes and the rest of the boys can hardly contain themselves with delight for won't they all have a trip up to the city so soon as the fish are ready to be sold and these trips are the great events of their life having got the fish nicely caught inside the seine the next thing is to get them out again the big net with its precious load is drawn as near the shore as possible 
the boats crowd round it and a busy scene ensues as the blue-backed silver-bellied beauties are taken from the meshes and piled up in the boats until these little craft can hold no more in a little while all the fish are safely on shore and then comes the splitting and salting in which not only the boys but the girls and their mothers too take a hand for the more quickly it is done the better the dexterity shown by the workers is astonishing holding a sharp knife in their right hand they stand before a pile of glistening mackerel with one motion they seize a fine fat fellow with another they split him open from head to tail with a third they despoil him of his entire digestive apparatus with a fourth they put in its place a handful of salt with a fifth fling him upon a pile beside them and the whole operation is done in the twinkling of an eye to see the girls at this and none are more expert than they takes a good deal of romance out of one's ideas of fisher maidens but it cannot be helped they cannot afford to be romantic or look picturesque their life is too hard for that kind of amusement in the catching of mackerel and herring there is not much danger and the fishermen need not go far from home but it is different with the cod and haddock and hake to get these big fellows you must go out upon the banks as those strange shallow areas in the atlantic ocean are called and going out upon the banks means being away for long weeks at a time and exposed to many dangers storms are frequent there and the waves run mountain high so that staunch and trim as the fishing craft are and thoroughly expert their masters hardly a season passes without the loss of a nancy bell or a cod seeker with all on board often alas do the women go weeping and wringing their hands for those who will never come back to the town another danger ever present ever indeed growing greater is that of being run down some foggy night by the great ocean steamers that are thronging past in increasing numbers picture to yourself a dense dark night when you can hardly see your hand before your face a little schooner tossing at anchor on the banks all but one of her crew asleep in their bunks suddenly there falls upon the solitary watcher's ear a sound that thrills him with terror it is the throbbing of mighty engines and the onward rush of an ocean greyhound as she spurns the foaming water from her bows springing upon the poop he shouts with all his might the crew below leap from their berths and though only half awake join him in the cry but it is of no avail the masthead light is seen by the steamer's lookout too late to change her course there is a splintering crash the iron monster feels a slight shock hardly enough to waken the lightest sleeper in her staterooms and the sharp prow cuts through the little schooner as though it were but another wave then the frenzied shrieks of strong men in their agony ring out upon the midnight air then all is silent again and the steamer speeds on to her destination while to another home in herring cove comes the dreadful experience of which the poet says Quote, how much of manhood's wasted strength of woman's misery what breaking hearts might swell the cry their dear fish to me End quote. yet it is the ambition of every boy at herring cove or shad bay to have a share in a banker or better still to own one all by himself and to this he looks forward just as city boys do to being bank presidents or judges or editors of newspapers hard work much danger a little schooling and still less playing is the summary of a fisher boy's life it makes him very healthy brown and strong but it never makes him rich the most he can do is to earn enough to build and furnish a cottage when he marries and provide plain food and coarse clothing for the family that soon springs up around him now and then that is whenever he has fish to sell he goes up to the city and this is his only holiday while still a boy he generally behaves himself well enough on these visits but growing older he does not always grow wiser 
i am sorry to say and i have often seen sad-faced wives rowing the heavy boat wearily home while the husbands lay on the stern sheets in a drunken stupor End of section eight. Section nine of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Lost on the Limits A Christmas Story. I wish you had taken my advice and stayed at the shanty, Harry. The speaker was a stalwart young man, so closely wrapped in a blue blanket capote that only a portion of his face showed itself, and the one addressed was a boy of sixteen, similarly accoutred. I felt more than half afraid of this storm overtaking us, the young man continued, and now we're in a pretty fix. I can't imagine how we'll ever reach the depot. There was something so despondent in his tone that one might have expected his words to exercise a dispiriting effect upon his companion. But instead of that, Harry answered brightly, Reach the depot? Of course we will, and in good time for our Christmas dinner, too. You mustn't worry on my account, Mr. Maynard. If anything should happen, it would be all my own fault, you know. You wouldn't be the least bit to blame. Mr. Maynard shook his head negatively. It's very good of you to say so, Harry, but I can't help feeling responsible all the same. Oh, he cried with a gesture of irritated protest against the situation, what a plague this snow is. Surely we've had enough of it already and didn't need this storm. John Maynard was the bush superintendent on one of the great timber limits of Booth and Bronson, the millionaire lumbermen of Canada. The duty devolved upon him of driving about from one shanty, as the permanent camps of the log cutters are called, to another, taking account of the work done and giving directions as to the bunches of timber next to be attacked. This was a very arduous occupation, entailing as it did long and lonely drives through forest roads, passable only in winter, across the broad bosoms of frozen lakes and along the winding courses of ice-bound rivers. For this purpose he had a pair of powerful horses and a low, strong sleigh made altogether of wood that had accommodation for just two persons and some baggage. As a rule he made these journeys alone, but this winter he had been favoured with a companion in Harry Brunson the eldest son of a member of the firm who had asked permission to spend the winter at the shanties his request had been readily granted for he would have to take his father's place in the business in due time and the more thoroughly he knew its details the better consequently mr bronson was very glad to let him go while harry rejoiced at getting away from the confinement of the office and at the prospect of having some exciting experiences before he returned. So far he had been having a very good time. John Maynard was as pleasant a companion as he was a competent bush superintendent, and while going the round of the shanties there were many chances for shots at partridges or rabbits, and always the exciting possibility of encountering a bear then at the shanties their welcome was always so warm and the french canadian shantymen were so amusing with their exhaustless fun of song and dance and story that harry never knew what it was to feel dull for a moment christmas week found him at the shanty on the opiango the one that stood farthest away of all from the depot at which maynard made his headquarters and to which it was his intention to return in time to celebrate Christmas there. The superintendent was particularly anxious to get back by that time, because having completed a round of the shanties, he could leave them unvisited for a fortnight or so, and he proposed to spend Christmas week in Montreal, where he had many friends. Harry, on his part, was hardly less anxious to get to the depot, for although he did not intend going any further, 
he had been promised lots of fun there by the clerk in charge and a first-class christmas dinner into the bargain accordingly when certain infallible signs of a change for the worse in the weather which had hitherto been almost perfect made their appearance and maynard willing to take any risk himself but reluctant to expose harry to danger suggested that the boy should remain at the opiongo shanty until the threatened storm passed and then get back to the depot by one of the ordinary teams harry would not hear of it no no mr maynard said he stoutly if you can stand the storm i can too i'm going with you clearly enough the superintendent would have to either allow harry to accompany him or stay at the shanty himself he could not accept the latter alternative so he replied very well then my boy we'll start and if bad weather catches us we'll have to do the best we can the distance between the opiongo shanty and the depot as the crow flies was fifty miles but the circuitous route that was necessary in order to avoid ranges of rocky hills and impassable gullies made it full half as long again and in view of the state of the road maynard calculated that two days might be required to make their destination accordingly they set out in the morning of the second day before christmas it hardly needed the practised eye of a wood ranger to foretell a coming change in the weather the sun's bright face was hidden behind a dense veil of sullen clouds the air that had been so crisp and clear seemed dank and heavy like a dungeon's and both man and beast moved about in a listless way as if every movement was an effort more than once the superintendent's mind misgave him ere they had gone many miles he was naturally a cautious far-seeing man not disposed to run unnecessary risks although utterly regardless of personal peril in any matter of duty not that he felt any concern on his own account but he would have felt much easier in his mind had harry been persuaded to stay at the shanty yet how could he reasonably expect that when he himself was pushing on to the depot harry's argument that if the superintendent could stand the storm he could also was not easy to answer and it prevailed if this confounded road were only in better shape we might get there to-night said maynard impatiently that afternoon as the sleigh slowly toiled up a steep ascent the horses sinking above their fetlocks in the fine dry snow at every step had their way been as well broken as a city street they might indeed have accomplished this feat but under the circumstances the best they could hope for was to reach the depot early on christmas eve harry understanding that he was the chief object of the superintendent's concern felt it incumbent upon him to take as hopeful a view of matters as possible so he responded in his cheeriest tone oh we'll get there to-morrow afternoon right enough we're more than half way to wolf hollow now aren't we yes a good bit more but there's the snow beginning we must drive ahead as fast as we can it'll soon be dark the horses accordingly were urged to the utmost speed possible and by dint of some rather reckless driving wolf hollow was safely reached in the face of a blinding snowstorm ere the darkness fell at this place there stood a shanty which had been abandoned some years before all the timber being cut in the neighbourhood and here mr maynard proposed to spend the night the building was found to be in good condition quite storm-proof in fact and it did not take long to gather an abundant supply of firewood wherewith to expel the cold damp air that filled it the horses could not be left out of course exposed to the pitiless storm so they were allotted the farthest corner of the long low room the sleigh too was brought inside with all its contents a substantial supper was prepared and enjoyed the horses were given a good feed of oats and then both the travellers being thoroughly tired they fitted up one of the bunks with the sleigh robes and so as to waste no heat lay down side by side and were soon sound asleep 
at daybreak the superintendent got up and hastened to see how matters looked outside the prospect was anything but cheering snow had been falling heavily all night and there seemed no sign of its ceasing all marks of the road were completely obliterated and it would evidently test to the utmost his knowledge of woodcraft to keep in the right track such was the condition of affairs that called forth the exclamation reported at the beginning of this story however there was nothing to gain by delay so hardly waiting to snatch a bite of food and to allow their horses to finish their portion of oats they harnessed up and drove forth into the storm even had the track been easily distinguishable they could not have made rapid progress for the snow came in big blinding flakes that were very bewildering and had already covered the ground to a depth of nearly a foot by the aid of familiar landmarks mr maynard was able for a time to direct their course accurately enough but about midday they reached a wide lake which they had to cross and here their real difficulties began the broad expanse of loon lake had presented a fine playground for the wind and upon it the snow was heaped in vast drifts far surpassing anything met with in the woods where the trees offered protection in these drifts the horses and sleighs soon stuck so fast that their extrication was evidently quite beyond the power of the passengers there seemed no alternative but to abandon them to their fate and to continue the journey on snowshoes which fortunately were lashed to the back of the sleigh mr maynard felt sorely reluctant to desert his faithful horses but no time could be spared for unavailing regrets there's no help for it harry he said resolutely we'll have to leave them where they are we cannot get them out and we've enough to do to look after ourselves the poor creatures whinnied appealingly as their human companions moved off and made frantic efforts to follow but the remorseless snowdrift held them fast it was certainly a pity to leave two such fine animals to perish but yet what could be done striding along on the snowshoes in the use of which they were both expert the superintendent and harry made better progress than they had been doing in the sleigh and now the chief anxiety was to hit the right spot on the other side of the lake where the road continued through the woods on a clear day mr maynard would have found little difficulty in doing this but in the midst of a blinding snowstorm it was no easy task and yet their very lives depended upon its successful accomplishment when they reached the middle of the lake they were dismayed to discover that the heavily falling snow shrouded not only the shore for which they were making but the one which they had left they were absolutely without a mark to guide them here was an unexpected peril mr maynard halted and strove to peer through the ominous obscurity of white but on every side it was the same what are we to do now harry he cried in a tone of deep concern i can't make out our way at all by this time harry's spirits which had hitherto been keeping up bravely were beginning to fall for he was growing weary of the long struggle with the storm i'm sure i don't know he responded ruefully i suppose there is nothing else to do but push ahead and take our chances of hitting the shore somewhere that's about all harry was the superintendent's reply just rest a minute to get your breath then we'll make a dash for it for a little space they stood still and silent the mind of each absorbed in anxious thought and then mr maynard called out come along now harry keep right in my tracks and i'll see if i can't make the shore all right for half an hour they toiled steadily onward and well it was for both that they had such skill in the use of snowshoes without them they could not have made a hundred yards headway so heavy was the snow even as it was the hard work told upon harry and presently he had to call to his companion hold on a minute mr maynard i'm out of breath the superintendent stopped short and came back to him not played out already are you harry he asked peering anxiously into his face oh no and the boy made a gallant effort at a reassuring smile i just want to get my wind that's all this abominable storm nearly suffocates me 
as they rested again for a few minutes the wind suddenly shifted parting the whirling snow to right and left and through the rift thus made mr maynard's keen eyes caught a glimpse of a dark mass rising dimly into the air a little more than a mile away with a shout of joy he slapped his companion upon the back crying eagle rock harry see and he pointed with a quivering finger to the spectral appearance once we make that i can find the road all right enough come along cheered by the sight which the next moment the snow curtain again hid from them they pushed forward with renewed energy it was terribly hard walking their snowshoes sank deep into the drifts at every step and it was an effort each time to release them the afternoon was also waning fast and they had not more than an hour of daylight left at best truly they were in desperate straits on they went over the drifts that seemed to be determined to bar their way the superintendent straining his eyes for another glimpse of eagle rock at last as harry was about once more to cry halt his companion exclaimed joyfully there's eagle rock harry i see it we're making straight for it a few minutes more will take us there the cheering announcement revived the boy's failing energies for another effort he shut his lips upon the request for a rest and doggedly tramped on after his guide ten minutes more and they were at the foot of the lofty crag called eagle rock in a friendly recess of which they found welcome shelter from the furious wind thank goodness ejaculated harry throwing himself wearily down upon a snowbank we got this far anyway how many miles more mr maynard about ten harry was the answer given in quite a matter-of-fact tone ten echoed harry in dismay i hoped it would only be about five i'll never do it in the world oh yes you will my boy replied mr maynard i'll help you you know to their vast relief the snow now began to abate and presently ceased falling altogether that's something to be thankful for said the superintendent are you ready to start again go ahead was the response but no sooner had one danger passed than another presented itself the light began to fail for night was at hand a ten-mile tramp on snowshoes through a desolate forest was not much to be desired under any circumstances to accomplish it in the dark tired as they both felt already was a feat the achieving of which seemed more than doubtful mr maynard had his misgivings but he carefully concealed them from his companion and even started whistling a lively march as he led the way along the faintly discernible road never will either of them ever forget that awful tramp the night soon unfolded them leaving only the scant light of glimmering stars for guidance every step they took had to be carefully considered lest they should stray from the track and be hopelessly lost again and again the silence through which they marched was broken by the blood-curdling cry of the lynx or the dismal howl of the wolf seeking what they might devour the superintendent's rifle hung at his back and harry had a good revolver but they prayed in their hearts they might have no occasion to use them every little while they had to pause that the boy might take a brief rest then on they went again mile after mile of the dreary toilsome way was slowly yet steadily overcome each one adding to poor harry's weariness until he felt as if he must give up the struggle and throw himself down in the snow to die but mr maynard cheered him up and helped him and kept him going knowing well that to give up really meant death at last the exhausted boy sank down with a piteous wail it's no use mr maynard i can't take another step oh yes you can harry said the superintendent soothingly just take a little rest and then you'll be all right while harry rested he went on ahead a short distance for it seemed to him that they could not be very far from the depot presently there came from him a glad hurrah and running back he put his arm around his companion and helped him to his feet exclaiming joyfully i can see a light harry we're safe now it's the depot and he was right they were within a half mile of their haven forgetting all their weariness they put on a gallant spurt and in less than ten minutes were in the midst of their friends 
telling the story of their thrilling experience all's well that ends well the superintendent kept his appointments in the city harry had a royal christmas time with the clerks in the depot and happy to relate the horses were not lost for a relief party that went out the following morning with a big sledge found them still alive and brought them and the sleigh back to the depot little the worse for the long imprisonment in the snowdrift end of section nine section ten of my strange rescue and other stories of sport and adventure in canada this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org my strange rescue and other stories of sport and adventure in canada by james macdonald oxley there's nothing for it maggie but to let the place go i've tried my best to raise the money but those that are willing to help a fellow haven't it to lend and those that have it ain't willing to help it's mighty hard lines i tell you and with a groan of despair alec mcleod buried his head in his hands as he leaned heavily upon the table hard lines it was indeed as no one knew better than moses shearer the money-lender to whose conduct was due alec the miller's anguish of mind he had chosen that particular time for enforcing satisfaction of his claim because he understood that it could not be done without a sale of the mill property and this was just what he desired as he intended to bid it in for himself it did seem a cruel thing for mr Malloud to be sold out of the snug well-equipped mill that represented his whole fortune and all for a debt of one hundred pounds incurred under special circumstances for which he was in no wise to blame no wonder that he was sorely cast down and that gloom reigned in his household which consisted of a devoted wife and two children robert the elder a sturdy enterprising lad of fourteen and jessie a sweet fair-haired lassie two years younger they were all in the room when the miller gave voice to his despair and rob full of sympathy hastened to say something comforting with all the hopefulness of youth don't give up yet father said he the sale is more than a week off and you may be able to get the money somehow before then mr mcleod shook his head without raising it from his hands he had exhausted every available resource and saw no way in which help could come he was not a religious man although of unblemished integrity of character and had no faith to sustain him in his grievous trial nor did his wife know how to lay hold upon god and claim the fulfilment of his promises in this they both had much to learn from their own children for thanks to sound teaching in sunday school rob and jesse believed in the prayer of faith they believed god was always ready and willing to respond in his wisdom to the petitions of his children and when they learned of their father's trouble their thoughts took the same direction that night when rob went up to his room he found jesse there oh rob she hastened to say i've been waiting for you to come what do you want to do jesse inquired rob why rob you know when father told us of his trouble i made up my mind to ask god to help him out of it what is that in the bible about god doing anything that two of his people agree to ask for proud of his memory rob promptly repeated the verse if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask it shall be done for them yes that's it exclaimed jesse now then rob can't we agree to ask god to help father to pay off that dreadful mr shearer of course we can responded rob heartily and we'll do it right away so down on their knees they went and each in turn presented an earnest simple petition to god that aid should be granted their father in the present emergency when they rose their faces were radiant it will be all right now won't it rob said jesse as she went to her own room the following day passed without any sign of an answer and so did the next rob boy-like began to grow impatient but jesse was more trustful 
Each night they renewed their united requests. On the third night, Rob, the window of whose room overlooked the mill pond, happening to awake about midnight, thought he heard a most unusual splashing noise coming from the pond. Sitting up in bed and listening attentively, he asked himself, "'What can it be? Has somebody fallen into the pond? No, it can't be that, or there would be cries for help. Oh, it's only some old cow that's fooling around.' He was about to accept this explanation and settle down to sleep again when there was added to the frantic splashing a hoarse bellow such as no domestic animal ever uttered. "'I must see what that is,' said he to himself. So out of bed he jumped, hurried on his clothes, and slipping quietly out of the house, hastened across the yard to the mill platform from which he could command a view of the whole pond. It was a bright, clear night, with the moon at the full, and the still waters of the pond reflected its silver rays like a huge mirror. At first the boy could see nothing to account for the strange noises he had heard, but presently he discovered a big creature, whose exact nature he could not make out, in the deepest part of the pond, where, surrounded by the floating logs which had rendered futile all its efforts to extricate itself, it was for the moment resting quietly, as though exhausted. Rob's appearance upon the platform evidently aroused the creature to fresh exertions, and it proceeded to fling itself about with reckless fury, in the course of which its head emerged from the shadow into a broad band of light, and with a cry of astonishment Rob, who had been bending over the edge of the platform, sprang to his feet. "'Why, it's a moose!' he exclaimed, and a monster one, too, and I am going to catch him." Then, looking down at the imprisoned animal, he added, "'Just stay there, my beauty. I'll be back in a jiffy to look after you.' Darting over to the house, he quickly aroused his father, who, as soon as he had assured himself that his son's story was correct, hastened to call up some of the neighbors. He did not stop to think what he would do with the moose when he had him safely secured. He was merely glad of a diversion that would help him to forget his troubles for a while." But Rob already had a scheme worked out in his mind, of which, however, he intended to say nothing until the capture had been successfully accomplished. Then he would let it be known. The neighbors responded readily to Mr. McLeod's summons, and in a quarter of an hour half a dozen men were upon the scene, some armed with pitchforks, others with stakes, and all eager to have a share in the honors of the capture. Many and various were the suggestions as to the best plan for getting the animal out of the pond uninjured, but no sooner had Mr. McLeod offered his than it was unanimously adopted as the best. By pushing away the logs, a clear space could be made leading to the incline up which the logs were drawn to meet their fate at the saw's teeth, and the miller's idea was to lasso the moose by the antlers, dragged the creature through the water to the foot of the incline, then attached the rope to the chain for drawing up the logs, and turn on the water power. The strongest animal that ever stood on four legs could not resist the tug of the chain, and thus the moose would be drawn up on the platform, and kept there a safe prisoner until he could be removed to the barn. Mr. McLeod had little difficulty in getting the rope fastened to the big branching antlers, and not much more in towing his captive around to the foot of the incline. But then came the rub. The monarch of the forest fought frantically against being drawn out of the water, and it seemed as if he might kill himself in his desperate efforts for freedom. There was no resisting the inexorable strain of the log chain, however, and foot by foot he was compelled to ascend the incline until he reached the platform. Then the power was shut off, and Mr. McLeod decided it was best to allow the great creature to stay where he was until daylight. The men all went back to their beds, but Rob remained. He did not want to leave the prize which had thus strangely fallen into his hands, and which he hoped to make signally helpful in his father's trouble. So he chose a corner of the platform where he could keep the moose in full view, and composed himself to wait for the morning. As he sat there, his heart went up in gratitude to God, for right before him had he not the answer to the prayer he and Jesse had united in offering? With the dawn, Mr. McLeod and the other men returned, and by dint of much shouting, flourishing of pitchforks, and tugging of ropes, 
the moose, after many furious attempts at breaking away, was at length safely conveyed to the barn, and securely fastened up in such a manner that he could do himself no hurt, struggle and kick as he might. "'Hip, hip, hurrah!' shouted Rob as the big door closed with a bang, and he flung himself against it to make sure that it was shut tight. "'We've got him all right enough. He can't get out of there until we want him.' "'And now that you have got him, Robbie,' said the miller, laying his hand affectionately on the boy's shoulder, "'perhaps you'll tell us what you are going to do with him.' Up to this point Rob had kept his own counsel, because his Scotch shrewdness told him it would be best to do so until the capture was successfully effected. But now there was no longer need for reserve. "'You remember that gentleman who was here hunting last winter, don't you, father?' said he, looking up eagerly into Mr. McLeod's face. "'You mean Professor Owen from New York?' "'Yes. Well, you know he said he'd give a hundred pounds for a full-grown moose alive, and now you must write and tell him you've got a beauty for him, and to come along and get it.' The miller's face became radiant as his son spoke. He now understood what had been in Rob's mind, and why he had shown such intense anxiety to secure the moose uninjured. "'God bless you, my boy,' he exclaimed, throwing his arms around his neck, for the revulsion of feeling broke down his characteristic reserve. "'I see what you've been driving at. You always were a bright lad, and now maybe you're going to save me from ruin. I won't wait to write Professor Owen. I'll telegraph him. He left me his address so that I might let him know when the hunting was good.' Mounting his best horse, Mr. McLeod hastened to the village and sent this dispatch to the professor. "'Have a splendid live moose in my barn. Do you want him?' Before many hours the reply came, "'Am coming for him by first train.' The following evening Professor Owen appeared. When he saw the moose, he fairly shouted with delight. "'A perfect specimen, and in the very prime of life,' he cried. "'I'll give you a hundred pounds for him on the spot. Will that be right?' The offer was gladly accepted, and as soon as the necessary arrangements could be made, the moose was taken away to become the chief attraction in a famous zoological garden. On the day before the sheriff's sale, Mr. McLeod, greatly to the moneylender's chagrin, paid his claim in full and cleared his property from all encumbrance. That night they had a praise meeting at the mill, for when Mr. McLeod was told about Rob and Jesse praying together for his deliverance from the grasp of Moses Shearer, his heart was deeply stirred, and he joined in thanking God, who had thus signally answered the children's petitions. Not only so, but both he and his wife were moved to withhold no longer from God's service, and they became active, happy members of the church. As for Rob and Jesse, their faith was wonderfully strengthened, and often afterwards the recollection of this incident helped them to be trustful in the midst of many difficulties. End of My Strange Rescue, recorded by Jerry Bird. Section 11 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley Section 11 Forty Miles of Maelstrom The Canadian Pacific train, speeding swiftly on toward Winnipeg, had just dashed over an iron bridge, which threw its audacious spider web across a foaming torrent, pointing down at the tumbling water beneath, one of the men in the smoking compartment of a palace car exclaimed, I'd like to try that rapid in my rice lake. Are you so fond of a wetting as all that? asked Charlie Hall with a smile. Oh, I'd risk the wetting. I've been through worse rapids than that without so much as being sprinkled. He proceeded to support his assertion by relating some of his adventures. When Jack Fleming came to the end of his tether, the others had their say, for they had not been without experience of a similar nature. Meanwhile, the fourth member of the group had been listening with interested attention, 
as if their stories were so novel that he did not wish to lose a word of them he was merely a chance acquaintance who had fallen into conversation with his fellow travellers through the freemasonry of the pipe they knew his name ronald cameron but they knew nothing more about him it was more for the sake of saying something courteous than with any idea of drawing the stranger out that fleming turned to him and said perhaps you know something about running rapids too the stranger's bronzed face broke out into a smile which meant unmistakably as well as grant if he knew something about fighting battles but there was not the faintest trace of boastfulness in his tone as he replied i have run a few rapids in my time well it's your turn now tell us your experience said fleming and without much urging cameron began i must explain that i am in the employ of the hudson bay company and have spent many years in the northwest districts my duties have required frequent long trips by york boat and bark canoe of which i have had my full share of tussles with rapids of all kinds i could tell you half a dozen rather exciting little episodes but i'll give you only one just now namely my passage of the long canyon of the liard in a canvas boat in a canvas boat broke out fleming half incredulously yes in a canvas boat repeated cameron not a particularly seaworthy craft i must confess but it was a notion of my own in order to get over the difficulty in which i was placed i had been over in british columbia and was on my way back to athabasca the season was growing late and i had only two men with me an indian and a half-breed the indian was a splendid canoe man but the half-breed was not of much account the first part of the journey could be made by boat easily enough but for us three men to drag a heavy boat over grizzly portage which is about six miles long and has a portage path that climbs a thousand feet up the mountain side was quite out of the question so before i started i had a boat made out of tent canvas which would be no trouble to carry the wooden boat was to be left at the head of the grizzly portage to take care of itself well we got on smoothly until we passed the portage and the long canyon opened out before us as i looked at its wild rush of water and realized that this was only the beginning and far from the worst of it i confess i felt tempted to turn back but my pride soon banished that thought and i set about getting my frail craft ready for the trip denizy the indian did not show the slightest concern but machard the half-breed was evidently much frightened assuming a cheery indifference i by no means felt i went about this work in the most matter-of-fact way and with denizy helping heartily the canvas boat was put together and set afloat but it became evident immediately that she was not minded to stay afloat long although i had taken the precaution to give the canvas a good coat of oil no sooner were we on board than the treacherous stuff leaked through every pore clearly this must be remedied before we could attempt the passage bidding the men gather all the gum and balsam they could find i put the whole of our bacon some ten pounds at least half a dozen candles and the gum and balsam into our pot set it over a brisk fire and produced the most extraordinary compound you can imagine with this we quickly daubed the outside of the boat from stem to stern and then left her for the night the next morning she was as tight as a drum and we started off the poor half-breed muttering prayers in full expectation of a watery grave the indian as solid as a statue and myself much more anxious at heart than i cared to have either man know the canyon is about forty miles long and in that distance the river falls quite five hundred feet old lepine who has piloted boats up and down the liard for thirty years or more asserts that once when the water was unusually high he went through the whole length of the canyon in a york boat in two hours 
the old man may be a few minutes short of the record but there is no doubt that in the spring when the snow is melting on the mountain slopes the river runs at a fearful rate i had hoped for low water but as luck would have it a sudden spell of intensely hot weather had set the snow going and the liard was just high enough to be a very ugly customer well we paddled out into the current and then there was nothing to do but steer i had the stern and denizy the bow while michard clung tightly to the centre thwart and was useful only as ballast like an arrow our little boat sped downstream darting this way and that dipping and dancing about like a cork doing exactly what the water willed at the very first swirl i found out something that gave me an additional shiver this was that the boat could bear very little pressure from the paddle if the water pulled one way and the paddle the other the frail thing squirmed and twisted like a snake instead of obeying the steerman so that it was quite impossible to make her respond readily or to effect a sharp turn no doubt denizy discovered this as soon as i did but he gave no hint of it as with intent face and skilful arm he did his part of the work to perfection the first few miles were not very bad but we soon came to a place where whirlpool followed whirlpool in fearfully quick succession and i no sooner caught my breath after escaping one than we were struggling with another our canvas cockle shell appeared to undulate over the frothing waves rather than cut through them i seemed to feel every motion of the water through her thin skin in the very thick of it i could not help admiring the wonderful skill of the indian in the bow again and again he saved us from dashing against a rock or whirling around broadside to the current for mile after mile we were tumbled about and tossed from wave to wave like a chip of bark my heart was in my mouth i could scarcely breathe my knees quaked though my hand was firm as with eyes fixed upon denizy i instantly obeyed every motion of his paddle in this fashion one hairbreadth escape succeeding another we did half the distance unscathed and made the shore by aid of an eddy at the head of the rapids of the drowned these rapids got their forbidding name from the fate of eight voyagers who lost their lives while attempting to run them in a large canoe being studded with rocks these rapids are extremely dangerous as the canyon widens out sufficiently to leave a narrow beach at this point we preferred portaging our canvas boat to impaling her on one side of the rocks it was a strange thing that our sudden appearance should have so startled two moose who were standing on the shore that instead of retreating up the hill they plunged boldly into the river of whose pitiless power they evidently knew nothing and were borne helplessly away to destruction a little later we saw their bodies stranded on the shoal and the sight gave me a chill as i thought that that perhaps would be our fate too before we escaped from the long canyon we had hard work getting the boat and ourselves over the broken boulder strong beach beside the rapids of the drowned and the boat had more than one close call as we slipped and stumbled about i've no doubt machard would have been glad to see it perforated with a hole beyond repair but by dint of great care and hard work we did manage to bring it through uninjured and then we halted for a rest and a bit of dinner when it came to starting again machard vowed he would not get aboard he pleaded to be allowed to follow us on foot but i would not listen to him i needed him for ballast in the first place and moreover if we did get through alive i could not afford to waste half a day waiting for him to overtake us drawing my revolver i ordered him to get on board he obeyed trembling and we started again denizy as imperturbable as ever we had the worst part of the passage still before us 
the sides of the canyon drew close together until they became lofty walls between which the river shot downward like a mill race the great black cliffs to the right and left frowned upon us as if indignantly and at every turn in the canyon a whirlpool yawned ready to engulf us again and again i thought we were caught in a whirl but in some marvelous manner dedesi extricated us and we darted on to try our fate with another extreme as our peril was it had a wonderful thrill and excitement about it and in the midst of it i found myself thinking that were i only in a big york boat i would be shouting for joy instead of filled with apprehension the great difficulty was to keep our boat straight with the stream for as i have already told you she was so pliant that she bent and twisted instead of keeping stiff and more than once i felt sure she would cave in under the tremendous pressure upon her thin sides to make matters worse she began to leak again and though i commanded machar to bail her out with a pannikin he did it so clumsily in his terror that i was afraid he would upset us and had to order him to stop we must have had an hour or more of this when for the first time dennessy spoke turning round just for a moment he pointed ahead and exclaimed hell gate i knew at once what he meant we had almost reached the end of the canyon there remained only hell gate and our perils would be over only hell gate i've not been much of a hand at praying but i'm not ashamed to confess that i imitated poor machard's example then as for him the moment he heard what dennessy said he fell on his knees in the bottom and clinging to the thwart set to pranging with all his might and main with a thrilling rush we swept around the curve and plunged into hell gate it is an awful place the walls of the canyon are two hundred feet high and not more than a hundred feet apart the deep water spins along at the rate of twenty miles an hour while at the end is a sort of drop into a black dreadful pool where the whirls are the worst of all we got through the narrow passage all right and then with a dive that made my heart stand still entered the whirlpools there were three of them and we struck the center one in spite of our desperate efforts it got its grip full upon us and round and round we went like a teetotum it is not at all likely that i shall ever forget that experience our flimsy craft seemed to be trying to collapse every moment it writhed and squirmed like a living thing and at every turn of the awful circle we drew nearer to its center which yawned to engulf us i had given up all hope and was about to throw away my paddle and prepare for the last struggle when suddenly there came a great rush of water down the canyon the whirlpools all filled up and leveled over for one brief minute the river was on our side with a whoop of delight dennessy dug his paddle deep into the water and put all his strength upon it i seconded his efforts as well as i could the boat hesitated then obeyed and moved slowly but surely forward and after some moments of harrowing suspense we found ourselves floating swiftly but safely onward with no more dangers ahead cameron ceased speaking and picked up his pipe there was a moment of silence and then fleming drawing a deep breath said with a quizzical smile perhaps you do know something about running rapids End of section 11